and let's say thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Johan, and I'm a member of the learning team here at CFNE, or the Cooperative Fund of the Northeast. And I just want to say welcome to you all. Welcome to Co-op Curious. This is a community learning experience for the Co-op Curious. Whether you're an entrepreneur, you're an existing cooperator, we're going to cover various topics around community ownership and how co-ops help to facilitate that. So a little bit about the organization that has allowed us to bring this to you, the Cooperative Fund of the Northeast. This is a nonprofit community development financial institution running uh, with this program for almost 50 years now, committed to economic justice for all through thriving cooperative enterprises. Over this course of time, we've built a reputation for providing co-op friendly financial products and services. And even recently, we've been offering more co-op business coaching, connections, and educational content. And we serve as an investment opportunity that promotes socially conscious enterprise. So as I mentioned before, I'm a member of the learning team here at CFNE. That's me, smiling face <laughs> in the middle there. And we've got a few others. We've got Carolyn on the call. We've got Carla on the call. And uh, I think Maggie's name is somewhere. We also have joining us today, Chris Linder. He's a lending officer here on the cooperative uh, fund, here at the Cooperative Fund of the Northeast in Maine. And so he'll be sharing a little bit about what we do. Uh, our team at the learn, uh, our, our, our learning team, we try to embody some of these strengths that you see listed on the screen. We try to listen to the whole ecosystem uh, in the Northeast, the co-op ecosystem, in order to serve folks better. We believe in equity and innovation, so creating value for those who are underserved. In this case, those who lack access to ownership opportunities, we believe co-ops facilitate that. And we try to learn from the lived experiences of each other and share those experiences. We believe in life-centered learning. So these are some of the things that make us who we are. And over the course of the last four to five years, we've provided um, several hundred hours of co-op coaching to emerging and existing co-ops or borrowers, applicants. And um, we hope to connect with you if you have an interest in learning more about co-ops or designing your own co-op. Uh, as I mentioned before, we help folks by facilitating access to capital. Specifically, we have a lending program that was developed for co-ops across the co-op life cycle and all types of co-ops. We also have a coaching program, no cost coaching for emerging and existing co-ops and our borrowers. And we also facilitate connections within the Northeastern co-op ecosystem, whether that's peer networks and fellowship or mentorship or referrals to co-op service providers. Today, we'll be meeting for about 90 minutes. We're almost 10 minutes in, and we'll be covering three main ideas. One, what is a co-op? We'll talk a little bit about that. And two, designing your co-op. How can you get into the practice of actually crafting your organization intentionally? And three, co-op capital access. How do you access the capital that your co-op might need so that you're ready for launch? So as we begin, I want to invite you guys to introduce yourselves in the chat, drop your name, where you're coming from, if you have a co-op, so that folks know who's in the room and can connect with you if you're interested in that. This is not going to only be an opportunity to connect with the learning team and the lending team here at CFNE. It'll be an opportunity to connect with each other. Hopefully, we can learn from each other's experiences and use that as a leverage point to be even more intentional with our community building efforts. So go ahead and do so if you haven't. Welcome to the Co-op Curious. Uh, this learning opportunity is meant for the community to benefit from. So what is a co-op? For those of you who've been here before or are new to this, what is a co-op? I wanna invite you to drop it in the chat. What would you say is the definition of a co-op if you were explaining it to, let's say, an eighth grader, you know, someone 13 uh, or so, 14 maybe. What is a co-op? What is the simplest definition you can give?
no right or wrong answers. But um, maybe I guess, go yeah, ahead. if we're going, if we're going with like an eighth grader, like nobody's the boss. I feel like that's an important thing to start off with, but like with that gap in um responsibility and um power, there's a need for like equal input from um every worker to to fill that um and to make those decisions collectively. Mm. Absolutely. No bosses, equal footing, making decisions collectively. I agree with that. Who else? Any other thoughts? How would you define a co-op? Explaining it to an eighth grader. Uh, I'll uh, I can give it a try. So mm -hmm. co-ops are, uh, not exclusively, but co-ops are worker-owned businesses. Are mm -hmm. businesses that uh the workers that uh the workers are the same bosses. They take decisions uh, in a democratic way. Mm -hmm. Everyone has a vote. And at the same time, uh, every member of the co-op uh, has to fulfill needs for the cup. So nobody just lays around and do nothing while the others do the work. Everybody has mm -hmm. to contribute. Gotcha. So... Uh, I, I, and I will... I will also point out that in co-ops everybody is on the same ship so when there's gains everybody got everybody gains some and when there's loses everybody loses some mm. gotcha appreciate that you know a type of co-op worker owned and everyone contributes all like that and kind of a shared future whether we win or lose we do so together so I think those are important points. And when I try to define this, the simplest I can make it is a member-owned business. A member-owned business. And that business is operated for the benefit of those members. All right? And this is important because usually when you look at the spectrum of enterprise in an economy like the United States, you have the owners, the operators and the beneficiary are three distinct categories of people. Whether well, you're all the way to the right on the for-profit side of things in the business, you might have an investor owner, class of folks, whether it's the stock market or local funder, you know, they're at the top. Then you've got the operators, their employees, right? Different group of people, different needs. And then you've got the customers, right? The people who benefit from the existence of that business. And oftentimes that separation between the owner, the operator and the beneficiary creates all manner of exploitation, extraction and um, exclusion, right? You might steal from the customers by providing inferior product. So you, the owners have more wealth, right? Or you steal from the employees to have more wealth and you know they're disgruntled. So that separation creates a lot of lack of empathy, right? Creates a lot of problems. Same thing on the nonprofit side. You might have a group of philanthropists or whoever who seed a fund to create some type of nonprofit possibly. And they're the governing board of directors, right? There's no owners in the nonprofit, but they're at the top. Then you've got the operators, the staff who might even be further segmented into administrative and program, but they're separate from the board of directors. And then you've got the beneficiaries, the people who benefit from the service. Again, three different groups of people. These communities, these enterprises are made up of separated communities of people. But in the co-op, you can have all three of these classes of people reconciled. Right? You can have a large membership class where there's five or 500 people, some of who operate the business as, as worker owners, and some of who are the directors. Right, they're on the board of directors providing the governance. So a co-op allows you to reconcile all three of these categories in interesting ways. Right. So a member-owned business operated for the benefit of those members. And usually it's on a one-member, one vote basis. 
So I, I like all of what you guys said, and that's how I try to think of it. Now, as we said, membership is key to the co-op, right? It's a member-owned business. And the members could be individuals or even companies who want to buy things and realize it's too expensive to buy alone. So maybe we can buy it together. Maybe we want to purchase electricity. Maybe we want to purchase a cow or some food, and it's just cheaper to do so together, right? So your members are purchasers. It's a purchasing co-op whether it's individuals or companies. Maybe the members are individuals who need to access housing. I live downtown Schenectady. They've made a lot of investments in this neighborhood. And so the owner of the building thinks he's gonna raise the rent. I can't afford that my job didn't pay me more, right? So now maybe me and the other residents can come together to create a company that can buy this building and pay rent to ourselves. So the members are residents in a housing co-op. Maybe we're workers, right? I'm a landscaper. I'm sick of having my wages uh, stolen because I'm undocumented. I don't know who to complain to. I'm sick of wage theft. We know we can do this job. Maybe we can create a company and buy this business from the owner and, and take over. And we are worker owners. The members are the workers. Or maybe we're sick of being underpaid. Maybe we realize, whoa, I'm not being as paid as much or compensated fairly compared to my peers and counterparts, right? Different race, different sex, genders, maybe that's happening. And so, you know, we're all architects. We're gonna be a, a worker owned um, design firm, right? Or maybe it's a group of parents in the community who need access to daycare because they have to go to work. Or maybe it's daycare providers who decide we're gonna come together to own this childcare um, provider um, this daycare, this nursery school, whatever the case is. And so the members are parents or the members are those child care providers. Perhaps it's a group of people who are sick of putting their money in a bank and can't get a loan. You know, I save all my money here. I can't get a business loan. I can't get a car loan. I can't uh, get a mortgage. So we're, put, we're members of a credit union. Credit union is an example of a co-op, right? The members are financial in nature. Or perhaps it's a group of people who produce food, like farmers, or maybe they produce art. And so buying together, whether it's equipment or selling together, whether it's through uh, you know, shared marketing efforts, branding our corn together, allows us to be producers in a producer co-op. So co-op is a member-owned business, and the members could be any one of these groups of people or even more. Or it could be a combination of members, right? A multi-stakeholder co-op having different types of members who are stakeholders in this co-op. So that's what a co-op is. And there's a lot of different ways to approach how we actually organize our community to solve these problems. Whether the, whether the problem is for someone who can afford it, a customer for a profit, or someone who can't afford it more on the nonprofit side of things. We can organize community-owned enterprise through a co-op to try to solve those problems in our community. Now, we talked about membership. The next piece of this is entrepreneurship. So some key terms. What's an entrepreneur? How would you guys define an entrepreneur? Drop them in the chat, come off mute. What do you guys think? No right or wrong, but you'll get a prize, maybe an invisible prize. I mean, it's like you're you're building your own business, like you're starting a business. Um, I feel like it usually implies that you're um, doing that from scratch. Although I feel like maybe people who buy businesses from other people would also be included in there. Mm -hmm. um, but I honestly, it's a word that I feel like a lot of people self-identify as that I actually don't know as much about as I thought I did now that I really think about it. Mm. It's true. It's one of those words that I get thrown out out there. I agree. I agree. It's kind of a French word too. It's like, what is this word? Entrepreneur. 
And can we say is um it's someone that is opening uh new uh that it's 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 opening up in the market it's like beginning new things in the market or mm -hmm. in a it, like in a way or it's not they're not always first timers but i'll say they they are making something new in the market they're bringing something new in the market nice nice yeah i saw that <laughs> consistent thing between you two with the from scratch or something new Stefan? Yeah, Stephen. Um, I, and, I, and I would add to that, um, to both of those comments that it's, um, sorry, my cat uh, wants attention here. Um, it's someone who invests uh, their money or time um, into a, a, a business or a venture, could be a nonprofit too, um, without a real, with a high degree of risk. <laughs> so they put, they, they put it out there with the, the that it may not succeed and they're taking a chance with their time or money. Absolutely. So all these concepts got risk, starting from scratch, something new. I think all these are absolutely relevant. You know, the term entrepreneur, entrepreneur entry, prime, take, take an entry into the marketplace, the first to step in. One of the ways I like to explain entrepreneurs, again, maybe to an eighth grader, is someone who solves a problem for a group of people and gets paid for it. So I see it as a problem solving opportunity or experience. Someone in a community who says, okay, people need you know, crackers. I'm gonna start a grocery store, right? People need housing. I'm gonna buy some houses, be a landlord. All these are entrepreneurial activities. Usually you see a problem and you take entry into the marketplace to address it. So someone who solves problems for a group of people. Now, once you're engaged in cooperative enterprise, again, there's membership, but there's also the business. A lot of the times we're not thinking as much about the business as we are about the membership. Or sometimes we think only about the business and not about the membership. But it's very important to consider this idea of entrepreneurship. How are we solving a problem for a group of people? If we're the customers, the problem is clear. Or if we're the workers, what is our um, what is the problem that we're solving and for who, right? The group of people, we call them the target market, right? Business jargon, but these are the group of people buying and selling this good, the competitors and the customers. Who are the people whose problem we're trying to solve? And then finally, another jargony term you might hear out there that I think is really important to entrepreneurship, the value proposition. And this is essentially the benefits that that group of people, target market, can expect from your service or product. And there's a value proposition for members too. So are we clear on what problem we're solving for our members? Are we clear on what problem we're solving for our customers? And the process of being more efficient and solving that problem, shifting resources and risk from areas that don't solve the problem in our business to areas that do solve the problem in our business is that process of entrepreneurship. And the entrepreneur, as you guys says, starts it, owns it, really feels responsible. But how do you share entrepreneurship? How do you share this sense of ownership, knowing that members are coming down the line? Or even that, you know, there might be one person, the founder of the co-op, who's a little bit more entrepreneurial, who everyone kind of leans into, to kind of get this entrepreneurial piece going. How do we share that capacity, right? Because it's a talent and a skill. So I'm gonna invite a panel to talk a little bit more about what ownership means. Yeah, thanks, Johan. Um, so ownership, um, I'd actually love to hear from y'all. What, what does ownership conjure up for you or what does being an owner conjure up? Might be positives and negatives. I mean, my initial thoughts definitely sway negative and, you know, thinking about the like <clears throat> historic and structural inequities that lead to who gets to be an owner, but trying to rethink that now that the whole idea is that 
the business I work at will all be owners and that completely switches like my associations with what the word would mean. Right. Yeah. It's got those residences of like the owning class as, you know, somebody, I think David mentioned earlier, like the people who lay around and just extract labor and money uh, from, from people and from the planet. Um, yeah. And um, anybody else also thinking like, let's see. <laughs> Chris says, makes me think of the seagulls in Nemo constantly saying, mine, 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 mine. Yeah. So it's the, it's the grabbing, it's the owning means taking it all for yourself. Um, and there's a greed component to that. Um, there were some folks who were going to join who were working with immigrant farmers. I'm not sure if any of them were able to make it, but I'm, I'd, I'd love to hear if any of them were here. Um, Water resonances of ownership in maybe different cultural contexts, whether it's uh, if you're from a country that um, has uh, experienced communism, if you're from uh, an indigenous group where ownership might be more about stewardship. Yeah, uh, I like this comment, ownership is responsibility. So like we're working with some um folks from tribes up in Maine who are like, ownership's not a real useful concept because ownership is just, you know, we shared ownership is what ownership means. We just hold everything in common. It's really more about our responsibility to take care of those community assets over the long term. Um, so for them, ownership's actually like not even a meaningful term. Um, but to the extent that it is, it's a really positive thing because it's about how do we care for what we share over the long term. Yeah, Stephen says decision making and sharing in the profit. So both ownership has that component of um, having the big picture in mind and making the decisions about it and also reaping the war rewards and sharing the risk, both. Um, Johan, do you want to advance it? Yeah, so, you know, there's, in one instance, it's ownership's just about what's at the bottom line. Um, what what comes out after you've taken your, your costs out from your revenue. Um, but more interestingly, ownership can be about how do I understand uh, how our business makes money, uh, how our business succeeds, how we meet our mission, um, you know, if the goal of cooperative ownership is to meet member needs and aspirations through a jointly owned and jointly controlled business, how do we make sure that business is successful so that we can meet our own needs? Um, I like this, uh, this kind of example because to a lot, uh, you know, I, I, I come from a, um, uh, worker owner conversion background. So I worked for a landscaping company. We bought out our boss. Um, most of my coworkers were Central American immigrants. Uh, none of us ever imagined owning a business. Um, and so, uh, you know, to all of us, when uh, we would look at the financial statements, this is sort of what it looked like. I mean, we spoke Spanish, but, you know, for any of you who are not Spanish speakers, you're looking at this and you're like, ah, that's a foreign language. I have no idea. I see some numbers there. I have no idea what that means. Um, but if you look at that dollar bill, little diagram, and you're like, ah, there's a big chunk, and there's a big chunk, and then there's a little chunk, and there's another little chunk, and that little chunk is what's left after we've paid all our expenses. Okay, there's an interesting story about what's happening with this business that we own together, and that little sliver at the bottom is what we use to keep the business going, to share with each other, to take home, home to our families. How can we make that little sliver a little bit bigger? How can we make decisions together about what's going to happen with that little sliver? Um, and that's where ownership gets interesting is, um, you know, how do we understand enough about this shared engine that we have uh, to do something good with it? Um, so a little bit about the, um, well, actually, before I go on, anybody have questions or comments 
so far about kind of the definitions portion of the program? Any surprises? Any disagreements? I do have a question. Yes. Um, maybe I'll drop it in. Uh, actually, I'll just ask it. Go for it. We're a small group. So um, I'm a little confused about the cooperative piece. Um, so typically, in a, let's say, for example, an LLC, um, if you form an LLC, depending on how you organize a company, uh, you can say each mem each owner, like a group of friends, group of four friends decide to start a company. They'll be members of that company. Um, is 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 are we using the same type of definition here? Does it that mean the same thing under the cooperative umbrella, um, or is it? I currently work for a nonprofit, um, although I'm starting a business, um, and the customers are the members. Mm -hmm. And you have your board of directors and you have your staff members and the customers are members. So they hold an annual members meeting to kind of fulfill that um, because it's in their bylaws. Um, if you, being part of this organization, is, is, is that the same type of construct that you have to follow where your employees, all employees have to be members of your company or can you select your members? So that group of four friends is the members of the company. They control and own the company. So they share in the profits and they share in the, the losses. Um, I know that was a mouthful, sorry that about was, that. That was, a, that was several really good questions. So I'm gonna try and parse them out. Um, so starting with, uh, you know, is an LLC basically the same as a co-op? Yes and no. Uh, you can have a cooperative that's structured as an LLC. Um, the only thing is that in order for it to be a co-op, somewhere in your operating agreement, it says we agree that we're going to operate democratically, which means each partner is going to own one equal share and be entitled to one equal vote um, and have a you know proportional share of the profits. Um, so whereas in a, a standard partnership, you can own different size shares and you get different amounts of voting rights based on how many shares you own. In a co-op, each member gets one share and one vote. Um, you can still have differential, you know, shares of, of the of the surplus of the profit, um, you know, based on how many hours you worked in the case of a worker co-op. So somebody who works 40 hours a week will get twice as much patronage or, or, or profit sharing as somebody who works 20 hours a week. Or like in a in a consumer co-op, if you're you know part of a like a, a co-op grocery store, somebody who purchases twice as much goods, who spends twice as much money with the co-op, will get twice as big a dividend back at the end of the year as somebody who who paid half as much. But each of them, regardless of how much money they spend with the co-op, um, when it comes time to vote for the board of directors, they each get one vote. They have the same amount of, of decision making power. Um, so that's that's the how's it different from a, a partnership part. Um, in terms of do all workers have to be members? They don't have to, but it helps. So um, typically in a worker co-op, there will be like a, a candidacy period. So um, you know we might say in a in a coffee shop, it's a pretty transitory population. Uh, maybe we say you have to work at the coffee shop for six months and then you're eligible to become a member um, in an architecture firm. Much higher uh, investment, much higher return, highly specialized. It might, you know, it might say you have to work there for five or you know three or five years before you uh, can become a member. But, you know, in any case, the co-op's going to set some criteria for what do you have to do for us to feel comfortable going into business together, basically? Um, but then um, it's really beneficial to have as many people who are eligible to be member owners as possible because um, then everybody who's working in the business has a stake in its success. You know, you don't have anybody who's like coming and just punching the clock and collecting a paycheck. Everybody who's a member is really thinking about what can I do to make this thing more profitable? What can I do to make it a better place for us all to work? What can I do to make sure that our customers are really happy and want to keep on working with us? Um, so there's a lot of benefit to, you know, 
having having ownership be as available to as many people as possible um rather than you know if you only have you know say you have four owners and 20 employees that starts feeling a little more like that extractive boss side of the equation um and there are, can be financial reasons why it's also beneficial to have as many owners as possible I'm like, that, that gets real into the weeds so i won't go there but um financially it's it's usually advantageous to have as many um people participating in, in membership as possible did i, I get all the parts of the question you did it prompts some more but i won't i won't drag it but um yeah uh it getting into the weeds is fine because um just to give some insight we're a, a home care company oh, and so cool. we will have a lot of one there's a high turnover in the home, yep. home care industry um and two there's typically you're going to have a lot of staff right because if you think about it for each client is going to be a staff member right and so um in that case that's why i ask are can we decide the stipulations or the bylaws for for the you know um for the co-ops investment into the company or um for lending practices um can we kind of set that rules and is there a room to discuss that that come you know how can that be structured for your company and make it work um so going getting to the weeds would, would be fine um because the, i want to understand that right but i, I guess there could be a follow-up conversation here but um thank you for answering my questions <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And we're actually, we're going to talk a little bit, Chris is going to talk a little bit about financing later, so he might get into some more details. But the the real short answer is that, you know, even if you have a large number of worker owners, um, usually they're going to elect a board um, made up of, you know, some some of their number and maybe some outside advisors if you want. But they're going to elect the board. Um, that board's going to be able to, you know, make decisions about borrowing and setting your bylaws and all that good stuff. So the co-op model is very flexible. You make it work for, for you and for your group and your community. Um, I'm excited that you're in home care. I'm going to put a link in the chat. Cooperative Home Care Associates in the Bronx is the biggest worker co-op in the U.S. It's over 2,000 worker owners, um, and it's a really cool story. So if you don't know about them, check them out. Um going to keep us moving uh can i just ask a quick question yes please and, sorry this may be in the weeds too but but um you're kind of talking th like theoretically about co-ops and llc's generally i'm just mm -hmm. curious like i assume that for say, for the cooperative fund of the northeast mm -hmm. in order to be eligible for um technical assistance or possible loans you'd have to like this certain requirements like you know one one member one vote kind of thing you'd have to actually like even if you're an llc and not technically a cooperative mm -hmm. under a cooperative statute you still would be eligible as long as you met these other requirements is, is that yeah right? our, our yeah our tests are really around um is there something in your bylaws your operating agreement that that codifies that one member one vote principle and then is there some form of equitable financial stake? Um, but yeah, you can be organized as an LLC, uh, 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 as, as corp, I mean, you know, whatever. Um, but most states at this point have a cooperative statute. And it's nice because that kind of bakes all that stuff in. Um, but yeah, it, really, we're just looking for is there evidence of democratic control and of um, financial particip participation? Thanks. Yep. Okay. Um, steps to starting a co-op. So um, this is uh, oversimplified, but um, you know the co-op is really starting with um, a group of people coming together to meet a shared need, right? So um, what you know the first thing is this problem finding. What is that need that you're trying to meet together? Um, and then who are your people? Uh, so who are the people who share that problem and who have the the energy to to do something about it? Um, so generally there's um, you know, some sort of a steering committee before you have a formal, you know, membership. You have a group of folks who've said, yes, we have the energy to work on this. 
we're going to talk to people, we're going to learn together um, and, and sort of drive the process forward. Um, in uh, cooperative history, particularly in African-American co-op history in the U.S., but across the board, learning and learning together has been a big part of how co-ops are formed, you know, starting out with study groups and book groups and stuff like that. Um, so that learning phase is really important, um, both looking at other co-ops, getting to know other co-ops, and also um, looking at different business models and understanding sort of your industry. Um, community building, um, both within your team, thinking about how are we gonna make decisions together? How do we learn to trust each other, hold each other accountable? Um, and then also, um, doing outreach. So, you know, for a larger, certainly for like a consumer co-op or something, there's the, the community outreach phase is really big because you need your, your, your shoppers, you need your consumer members. Um, but even in a worker co-op, it might be, um, you know, what are the gaps in our team? What are skills we want to bring on board? Um, who can we find who, who brings those skills, um, who we might want to have on our team? Um, Customer discovery. So hopefully you uh, you know have a business concept. You have an idea of like here is the thing that we feel like we have a value. Who are the people who we can exchange value with? Who are the people who have a problem that we can help solve? Um, and reaching out to those people and trying to understand their pain points and how your service or, or products can can resolve those pain points. Um, business formation is the uh, this is this is where things get you know formal in terms of actually going and incorporating, forming an entity, um, developing a business plan, um, getting your name out there and branding, um, and then you know once you have an entity that can uh, access capital, you can look at um, are we eligible for some grants, some loans? Do we want to have a crowdfunding campaign? Um, are we far enough along that we can do a, you know, offer a pre-sale, um, those sorts of things. Um, and then finally launch. Um, next slide. So that was real linear. The real world is not linear, especially projects made up of multiple people are not linear. Um, so this is really, you know, often this is more what it looks like is that you have kind of an iterative spiraling process where, you know, we, start organizing and then we learn some things and we go back to our concept and then we try and get money and we hear that there are some holes in our in our projections and we go back to the drawing board and you know it's a lot of that and even once you launch uh it's going back and saying you know how do we continue to find new customers how do we continue to solve our community's problems um so just recognizing that uh if it feels a little messy it's not because you're doing anything wrong that's real natural <laughs> Um, and, um, cooperatively ever after, this is just a, you know, slightly different look at these phases. Um, anybody who's, uh, an organizational development geek, you might've heard of sort of the, the four phases of development of, of organizational development as, um, forming, storming norming and performing. And this is sort of that framework of, um, you know, you start out and you have like a visionary pioneer or a group of pioneers who say, we see a problem, we want to solve it, we see an opportunity, we're going to get in there and, and get started. Um, then that storming phase as things get a little exciting, you have a little bit of a circus, um, people with a bunch of different ideas trying to figure out how to actually get it done. Um, and hopefully, you know, learning how to have, um, generative disagreements, generative conflict, um, and turn that into something more robust. Um, norming is like professionalization and standardization. Um, how are we going to be together? What is this entity going to look like? What's our brand? How are we going to put ourselves out there in the world? Um, what are our operational processes? How are we going to behave? All that kind of stuff. Um, and that's when, you know, you really have membership, you're formalizing member agreements, people are buying in. Um, and then 
performing. You're you're actually up and running and thinking about how are we going to be human together. So we've we've created this entity, and now we got to spend the rest of our lives together. Um, so uh, you know, I a lot of the times I I think as a parent about uh, you spend nine months reading all the what to expect when you're expecting books and getting ready and and then they send you home from the hospital with a baby. They're like, yeah, let's buckle them into the car seat. It's good to go. Have fun. And then, you know, you have the rest of your life to learn about this human and be human together. And that's kind of what it's like uh, launching a co-op is that, you know, the launch is really only the beginning, even though in the previous graphic, it showed it as like the end of the process. It's only the start. And then it's a constant reiteration of, um, you know, how do we continue to provide value for our members? How do we continue to grow together? How do we bring on new members and help them understand what the co-op's about? Um, there's, um, for those of you who are familiar with the co-op principles, the fifth co-op principles about education and information. And um, that's really got to be part of the ongoing makeup of a co-op is um, always being in leadership development, planning for succession, thinking about your next group of members, um, not just like, okay, we built the thing and now it's set it, forget it. You know, it's it's business. There's constantly forces that are are buffeting you around both internally and externally. All right. So you've seen a little bit about the path. Now, should you start a co-op? Well, the first step is their self-defined problem, right? A lot of the times, problems are defined for us, whether you're dealing with, uh, you know, a federally designated term, like, for example, uh, food deserts, right? That's sanctioned by the federal government all down. You might be tempted to say, we have a food desert. But maybe your problem is different. Maybe there's been systemic exclusion. So maybe it's more like food apartheid. Or maybe it's something else, right? Digging deep to find and define that problem for yourself. Two, is it, prob is it a problem shared by a community of people, right? Is it going to affect more than you? Because obviously with a co-op, you're looking for a shared solution, a cooperative solution. So is there a self-defined problem shared by a community of people? And is that community of people willing to share responsibility for solving that problem, share the rewards for solving that problem, financial or otherwise, and share power, decision-making, information, uh, money? How do we share responsibility, rewards, and power for this problem? And I would, you know, not even number this one. Um, is there a sound business of three or more people who like each other? Right. If you don't like each other, it might not work out so well either. So these are kind of some key things that I think people should consider before starting a co-op. And, and if you can say yes to any of these, two, three, four of these, then yes, get started. Now, what do you do once you get started? And I think I can start sharing my screen and invite one of you. Uh, this is a tool that we co-created with some friends of ours down below, go to work institute, lift economy, see commons in Hudson Valley, to put together a framework that could really help people think about designing their co-op, just intentionally creating the basic elements to get started in cooperative enterprise. Now, I'd like to invite one of you, I'm going to kind of do a live situation and hear from others as we go along, the answer to these various prompts. Who would like and who's nascent? Uh, I see small format, and I see uh, you know some other folks in the group. Who has a co-op they're trying to design right now that we can walk through this process with? I mean, I'll volunteer small format, but I also feel like I've talked a lot. So if there's another group here that would rather go, that totally works too. Any objections? <laughs> Small format, you guys good with that? <laughs> yeah. well, let's do it. Okay. So I'm going to actually minimize my screen, but I'm going to zoom in. 
and we can kind of think about each of these pieces. So hopefully this is still big enough. Maybe I can do a little bit of a zoom. You might have to see me leaning in and squinting, but it it works. It definitely works. <laughs> do a slight zoom. All right, maybe this is good. So with this situation, we've got a few squares, and I'll just talk us through each as we're going to be with that. So uh, I don't want to zoom anymore. Let's get out of this. All right. So the first thing, as we mentioned before, is to start with the problem. So is that problem that, you know, we need to earn more or we're housing insecure or we need to access some food, good or service? What is the problem that the people who are coming together or for you guys, small format, that your people face? What is the problem? I'm sure Atlas and Tamika can jump in on this one too, but the first thing that comes to mind is that in Rhode Island, there are so few openly queer spaces um, for our community to exist in, especially um, that are, you know, multi-generational spaces, you know, all ages, um, spaces that are open during the day. Um, so that would be, I would say, the first problem that I could identify. Um, mm -hmm. but the business has already been around for, you know, over three years now. So, um, I'm sure that Tamika could speak on that as well. Um, yeah, I think that, that, that's a really good one. I just to like add on to that a little bit. Um, I guess the way that I think about it is, um, there are few third spaces that have existed for queer community that, um, allow us to fully be out of the closet. Um, aka that don't just uh, center us being in dark bars at night, um, or centering alcohol consumption, uh, things that don't maybe allow us to fully um, connect to, you know, and the third space idea being the connecting to the most realized versions of ourself. Um, so yeah, few, few third spaces for queer folks um, that also work for a queer community that isn't just um middle class like white gay men um there's there's a uh, yeah that was certainly something that was lacking um and that or that wasn't like a non-profit that is often well non-profits have like do a lot of good work in our community um a lot of their programming has to center around the grants that they get um, and often provide programming that doesn't actually meet the needs of the community today, but meet the needs of the grants um, funders. So by opening this space that is for us, by us, we, without, as a co-op specifically, um, we can actually create programming for our community um, that, is relevant to the change the changing needs um of of our community um not yeah just yeah programming that nonprofits aren't able to provide for sure the other the last thing i'll say is um a, a problem that i could identify is that tamika does not want to be the sole owner and so uh the co-op is like a a welcomed uh structural change for the business that has already existed and for the newer members that are have you know come on um since that idea was originally um thought of um like it was always meant to be um a collaborative endeavor so um so yeah that would be one other thing yeah yeah I, yeah the for us by us should look like all of us not just like you know one one person um Kind of. Yeah, and like the risk level of owning a business by yourself, like, you know, historically, the only people who have access to the resources needed to run a business by themselves and, you know, the level of risk involved with that involves a lot of privilege, so. Absolutely. So yeah, we'll, we'll, of... We're making your job note taking a little difficult. We can. <laughs> no, it's, it's okay. And, you know, quickly trying to capture a few thoughts. But I think the bottom line is you guys are trying to access something, right? 
as far as the potential members of this uh, community in, in mind, right? In Rhode Island, folks who are realizing themselves in the queer community uh, needing a space. So we'll look for access. Maybe it's other things. Maybe each member has different needs that we need to articulate. And then we need to rank for which is shared, which is most painful, right? So these are things we're going to have to do. We're going to have to agree on a, pro a problem, and there may be many competing for attention that we're going to solve and start solving that together. So would you guys say access is fair here? Yeah. Now, who else has wrestled with this problem? Not this particular problem, but the problem of finding the problem. Has anyone else created a go up and have had to think about, you know, what are we really doing here? What are we responding to? I can give a very different example. I think it might be. Um, it was this was a this was a co-op that was sort of in formation, but it's it's on the table now. But but the the problem was that um there was uh there was a group of people who had um a common interest in um well in really starting a cooperative venture um but uh and this is sort of like at the board level mm -hmm. and, and but they all but all the, the group of people had very different um um experiences backgrounds and expertise that that to get coming together would have provided this really great service um and um so you know, people provide their different expertise and, and experience, mm -hmm. and then provide services to this to the group, or, or to the to the client, say, or the gotcha. customer. And how'd you guys wrestle through this problem finding, knowing that we got skills we want to contribute? It, it didn't get. It didn't actually. Um, it didn't get that that far, but um, mm -hmm. it's still a problem. But it's still a problem to be solved, and. Um, it was it was sort of I like the the thing was that there weren't really resources. Mm -hmm. it, it was too time consuming to do it like on a volunteer basis, and there weren't enough uh, resources to pay people. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea was that people would contribute at, at this level until there was going to be um, some revenue coming in from the shared services or maybe some grants. Yep. Perfect. So thank you for that. When we think about this, we have to realize that we have to find the right problem. Sometimes we think the problem is, you know, there's not this service. And then we dig a little deeper. Actually, there are folks who want to solve this problem by providing this service, but there's not funding for it. Okay. Now the problem is finding funding. Actually, we talked to some funders. They want to provide funding, but they don't have any relationships with people who have the skills to solve this. So now the problem is connecting. And so you keep digging and digging and you have to think about, is this the right problem? We may have multiple problems among our community, within our community, but we have to find the right problem. We may have competing problems, which is the most painful, right? So let's keep rocking. So let's say we know what the problem is, You know, perhaps it's access, perhaps it's something else. Now we decide we, we like each other, we've self-defined the problem, we might have a cooperative solution. Um, what are we gonna do together, right? Are we gonna sell something together? In this case, I would have something and I sell it. Maybe I produce food, we're gonna sell food together. You know, we're all chefs. Are we gonna buy something together? Maybe we're all gonna chip in to rent this space, right? Maybe we're making something together. Maybe we have a magazine or whatever in the space, or we make the space, with, make the events that happen in the space, make it a welcoming space. Are we going to share something? What are we doing together to solve this problem? So now, small format, we can dive in again. What are we doing together that we can't easily go on? Hi, this is Luna from Small Format. Um... Yeah, I feel like with the experience of small format here, we've learned that it takes a lot of like, yeah, the discovery of who our guests are, tending to the needs of our guests and what, you know, people consume. Um, 
menu building, uh, curation of how the space is going to look like, um, that all takes costs, um, expenses like fridges, espresso machines, um, renovation and stuff like that. Um, feel like also plays a role on the the question that, that was just asked. Sorry, I'm trying to zoom in here, but I can't really see. Oh, no. So what I'm hearing so far, as far as making the experience, gathering the equipment, you know, sounds like making together, sharing, selling together. What do we, um, what do we think? Appreciate that contribution, Laura. Um, can I, can we throw in there, like, you know, food and drinks, like selling is something that, that we're focused on and nourishing, um, others, um, yeah, think of selling as uh, the selling and sharing of like food and drinks as being like the common ground of, um, yeah, uh, of what we're doing to like solve the problem is to like offer a common ground. Uh, and I, I mean, we kind of like talked about what the problem is, but like when creating this, um, deep, we narrowed in on the these problems, but part of like uh, the problem initially also included like the service industry or like food and um, drinks is primarily uh, it's like the servers are queer folks like brunch we like made brunch <laughs> uh, we uh, like jokingly like invented brunch um, you know but we we don't see the actual like payout for these sort of things um, nor do we actually get a lot of like curation and that sort of so by creating this space that we we get the we get to sell and use like the skills that we cultivate and reap the benefits um when they're when those benefits start rolling in uh you, you know um by selling food and drinks we'll be able to um yeah we we have a lot more autonomy in in this um I'm not being as concise as I'd like to be but uh it it was like so the service industry also can be um, a difficult industry to like it's long hours, um, really hard working conditions, oftentimes like a uh, lack of, of like racial, like uh, economic, like the various things they those that were they are not talked about in the workplace at all. It's just like serve your guests, get the things out, move as quickly as you can, and um, you know use your charming personality, get that tip, and get out of there. Um, and now we are able to um, create an environment together that we can do all those things, like we can sell these things, curate these things, have that, um, but also not have the toxicity and like, yeah. it creates like the, yeah, the common ground for everything. So I guess like another part to that, what will be different in the world when you succeed is like changing what the norm is for the service industry um with the focus on like you know our, our target audience being queer people yeah I think that between all of us we're able to offer something that's like not only a um like a food and drink experience but um like Atlas has so much experience in event planning Luna is a performer I'm an artist Tamika has worked in nightlife for so long like together we're able to cultivate an experience for people where it's like, yes, they're treating themselves to, you know, a drink and a meal with their friend that they might not be able to have another time of the week. And we get to be like the the best part of their week, which we love. But then also, um, you know, providing all these opportunities for other programming or other experiences along with that, which is something that maybe not every other um, brunch thought would be able to offer. So people are coming in for, um for kind of that that combination of experiences that we're able to provide, which I think if any single one of us was the owner directing that programming, it wouldn't be nearly as rich. Gotcha. So, you know, under this idea of cooperative solution, we've got to think about what are we doing together? Sounds like we're curating, aka making, selling, and sharing food, drinks, experiences. 
And what's going to be different in the world when we succeed? Reimagining the surface energy, changing the norm, centering the core community. And so what if we do that? That community can reap the benefits of the service industry for once. And so what if that happens? And so what if that happens? This is a prompt that I push people to when they're asking what's going to be different in the world. Because we're talking about purpose. Why does this exist? What is the end result of this thing coming into existence? And so, you know, this is an important piece when it comes to aligning our activity towards that North Star. Lots of people are going to have different problems, different ideas. Once we are able to articulate this, we can create alignment, right, which is a major reason for scattering. Now, I want to open it up again. Who's wrestled with what are we going to do together and uh, what is the purpose of our entity? Who's, who's wrestled with uh, having tried to do this before? Anyone? Um, separate from my experience with small format, I was a part of a tenant union where there was this shared interest in housing justice and, um, you know, solving problems around um, um, unaffordability of housing or unsafe housing conditions for tenants. And there was so much interest from so many people, but a common issue was like the how do we solve that or like which um, avenue do we take to solve that? Like, are, are we pressuring local representatives? Are we, um, you know, building support within apartment complexes? Like, I guess thinking about like, once you have the motivation and the organization from a lot of different, different people, then there's still so many steps after that that have to happen. And sometimes it's like hard to see that when mm -hmm. it's already a question of like, will we even be successful at, you know, this, these first few steps, like, how do you even think ahead to like, well, what then? Yes, yes. So that's excellent. Uh, our solution has to realize our vision. When there's competing visions, it's unclear whether that solution is going to do so, right? Because it's competing visions. We, have, we see so many different problems. How are we connecting our solution to that vision? And so I think that's a big piece of the puzzle that is often kind of underdeveloped. So I want to, to encourage, I want to encourage you guys to think of that. But let's keep rocking. So we know we have a problem, maybe it's access to the space, and we know we have a solution. Let's make this space. And who are the we who's making this space? Is it producers, individuals, or companies, or entities who are working together to make something, not as employees, but they're just making it to sell it? Are we members who are going to buy from a company we own, consume that service together? Are we workers, you know, employee owners who are going to actually show up day in and day out at the same place under the same conditions to make this together? Who will organize to meet this need? Small format, yeah. Um, Atlas and Tamika and Luna, let me know if you have other thoughts on this um, or if I'm missing things. Um, we definitely propose that we will all be working owners, um, but also as a business that's already been around for over three years, we definitely are reaching out to our audience that has been like very loyal and supportive since we've announced this shift. Um, and they're definitely helping organize to meet the need with us, which we're very appreciative of. Um, and in, in addition to working owners, we've already started to discuss like who in our community would make for a good board member. We have multiple people who have been around since the beginning of small format, not necessarily as employees, but as community members who have so much insight to offer. Um, and I think you know, leaning on leaning on that is definitely going to be important for us. I'm hearing broad audience that we have people might fill different roles. Some people might be down here, uh, not necessarily as direct members, but they're board directors, 
you know, they need it for our success. Who are the members? And are they any one of these or a combination of these? Yeah, I mean, it will be all, all five of us as, um, as working owners. So we'll have uh, the four of us who are here in this call and then Trip, who um, was not able to make it um, as well as so far we've, we've discussed but not finalized, I believe, two potential board members that we're excited about. Um, so, I mean, tentative on that, since obviously we need to finalize, um, those thoughts, but, uh, and we've talked about, um, we've talked with them so far, but nothing's, nothing's concrete, but yeah, two potential board members who are not working owners. Yeah. And the, the initial organizing obviously is, um, the five worker owners, but, um, the overall, like the long term plan is to bring on um, other folks that can add to their expertise uh, to to what we're working at currently um, to, de you know, ideally um, developing different, like we've been talking about doing catering. So bringing on another worker member who has experience in that, um, you know, different folks who have um, can enrich what we what we have where we are not as strong um yeah so we we've got at least like one to two more um ideally people that after a probationary period will also be part of um the co-op uh as full full worker members gotcha so this is excellent so typically there might be one class of member, right? Again, producers, we make food, we're farmers, we have our own business, or we're all marketing experts. We're gonna come together and produce content for this company, produce a co-op. Consumers, we're in the queer community, we wanna access this space, we're gonna do a monthly membership. Earlier, there was a question about, oh, what if you know, your nonprofit, the clients are the members? Well, in a co-op, we're thinking of a member-owned business, but, you can still have members in a business not owned by its members. Your Spotify, your BJs, you can have shallower pools of ownership, maybe simply access, and they're members, right? We're members who can access as opposed to members who can own. So there's lots of ways to configure membership, right? It might not be member ownership, which is what we're talking about, shared identity, but there may be other ways for other stakeholders to get involved. And perhaps, there are ownership opportunities for other stakeholders. You can have a producer co-op and um, you can have producers of food, maybe the farms that you partner with to buy the food that you're going to sell and the workers. And now you have multi-stakeholder co-op with two classes of membership. Now you have to reconcile the interests of both groups, right? We have to make sure we send to the queer community, what's the proper price that we have to pay you and the least that we can pay the most that you can get to make sure our community gets the food it needs, for example, because now we have interests competing, right? We want to have the best price. We want to pay the cheapest price. So once you have multiple classes of membership, you have to deal with that. Otherwise, you can have shallower pools of ownership or simply access for membership. So I want to I want to go for maybe another minute or two on this last piece, and then uh, we can kind of open it up and shift over to the co-op capital piece. So once you have the members, you now have to say, what, do, what will each member be asked to contribute? You'll have an initial contribution and an ongoing contribution, right? Initially, you're thinking of a buy-in. Will we have a financial buy-in? Or to get this thing started, would a member be asked to give member loans or member investments in some way? And then ongoing, what are members being asked to contribute? Since we're all workers, labor, but perhaps we're all being asked to contribute admin time, right? Planning events, things that aren't necessarily directed to make money. What do you guys think about what each member will be asked to contribute? Yeah, I think definitely our, our time, um, you know, outside of shift work, there's 
certainly a lot of labor going into like the admin side of things or, you know, revamping our, our physical space to be, um, you know, more accessible, have more seating. So um, definitely those things that you mentioned. Um, we're also thinking a lot about, you know, with each of us coming from very different backgrounds professionally, like what, what insight everyone has to offer. Like Atlas has so much knowledge on, you know, the finance side of things, which is really helpful since um, for a lot of us, we've spent most of our time in, you know, entry level type positions where you're working really hard, but you don't have as much say or agency in what the business is doing. Um, and so having someone who has um, kind of um, more experience on that side of things is really helpful. Um, so yeah, definitely um, those, those variety of experiences. Um, and yeah, like time going into uh, training programs that we're all um, thinking about, whether it be on, you know, training for barista classes or um, different certifications, like all of that time, um, in addition to, you know, obviously the regular, the regular working shifts. Yeah. And there is that monetary component, even though we're working to obviously you know, in, in working to create access, um, and all coming from, um, working class or low income backgrounds, uh, you know, like, oh, hyper aware of what, what it means to create access, including that there's like this monetary, um, needing to be willing to take the risk and invest, but also, um, making it accessible to, um, the, to ourselves, to each other, uh, to, to new members. Um, so uh, as of right now, we've all put up money for like, you know, fee fees, filing fees, been splitting that sort of stuff. Um, even evenly, uh, and that's, yeah, I mean, part, part of starting and being in a co-op is that initial, um, investment, uh, that we're all currently going five ways on. Yeah, I think for me, in the ongoing sense, it's personal in the way that like, I finally get to work in a forest bias environment and be part of a third space that is so welcoming in itself of the members as well. Like everyone really takes care of like pronouns, you know, something as simple or not as simple as that. But, you know, the 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 desire of being able to share Share that as an ongoing thing like the next generation of people that come and are you know leading this space um yeah i just wanted to mention that excellent excellent and so let's keep working to finish this piece out um how will decisions be made right who will decide what oftentimes this goes unspoken right you enter a group and everyone is kind of like talking about an issue and then a decision is made after someone speaks, right? It's unclear how decisions are being made. Everyone's following the leaders unspoken or, you know, you wait until somebody, you know, says something and then you go along. How are decisions made? This is often unarticulated, right? We don't know if we're voting. We don't know if we're talking this thing to till it's tired. We don't know if it's unanimous voting or majority voting or one of us is going to be delegated the responsibility and consulted with lots of ways to make decisions. Um, articulating this is an important part of sharing that power, right? Those two major powers that every owner is looking for, the opportunity to say what happens, decision-making, and then access to the financial reward. So we want to think about that. How are you guys thinking about that? Um, I, I'm trying to remember the name of it, but Trip has introduced us to the fists of five method for voting, which is where instead of raising your hand or not raising your hand, um, you're ranking on your fingers, how, um, enthusiastic you are about your vote. So you can, um, you know, you can say all five fingers in like, that's a yes, or a four is like a yes, but with, with caution, um, you know, uh, and so on. So that allows for a little more nuance in the vote and for us to kind of hash that out aside from just a black and white yes or no. Um, for our bylaws, we have primarily discussed 
um, unanimous voting in most cases. We're such a small team that it feels important to have every single one of us on board. Um, but that's, you know, certainly something that could change if we were to grow in size. Um, and then, I mean, on maybe this is more a day to day level, but we don't want to have managers we don't we've all worked in environments with uh with managers in the workplace and um our solution to that has been the idea of a shift lead so while we're you know running service and you know things are busy people want their food out we have um one person um kind of running the shift making sure we're getting people on break but also meeting the needs of our guests but that's not necessarily a a stagnant position that one person would hold it you know can depend day to day who's going to be the shift lead maybe one day Tamika is shift lead and the next day I'm shift lead even though we're both on that on both of those shifts together um so kind of the idea that you know somebody needs to be the parent in a lot of situations but it can be we can all be each other's dad instead of you know one person always being the dad mm. Yeah, I think also like um, there's a lot of small decisions that, you know, how how do you make a decision on um, we are like starting a new merchandise program um, and we're starting a lot of new things. And like there's so much um, to metabolize all the time and it, it's easy. There's a lot of small decisions to be made that if we talk to all, every single little thing, it would it would we would never get through a meeting. Um, and so a lot of it is about being like, I, um, so-and-so has signed up to take the lead on this. They've made everything like transparent. Um, so you have access to all of the information. Um, you can choose to go through and uh, this are these are the main decisions they have made. If you want to go ahead and look at them, if you want to talk about them, we can. So the option is there, the, the transparency is there. Um, and it allows us to make decisions that keep us keep us moving um, without uh, creating, yeah, open open access being like the huge huge thing there. Like open access to information, um, documentation. Uh, not everyone is going to be on every single tiny decision, but everyone has access to be able to see how the decisions are made. And then we have certain things in our bylaws where they can actually. Um, within two weeks of a decision being made, if they weren't, even if they weren't there to make that decision, they can dispute the decision um, to the group. And it can, like, there's like written in steps to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to be a part of the decision making, um, even if they didn't know they wanted to be at the time or needed to be at the time. All right. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense, right? If we're going to empower people to make decisions, they need to feel they have the information to make that decision. And perhaps that's not only before, it's after. And if we're going to share management, we need very clear, transparent um, documentation around that. And this final question, what will each member be entitled to, right? Information, money, these are usually well-guarded treasures in most businesses, right? The financial information, the cost of information, the suppliers, or the financial rewards and all of those things. So uh, we're going to stop here so we can cover co-op capital. But uh, in the audience, if anyone who's wrestled with these issues, they're maybe further along or they've done other things, I want to give you the opportunity to share as I invite um, Chris over to discuss the co-op capital portion. So does anyone kind of engage this last column, participation? differently or has something interesting that they wrestled with when they were trying to deal with this? Then I'll pass it over to Chris to talk a little bit about co-op capital. And uh, just to reiterate, you know, once you design your co-op, you start with the problem, you make sure that problem is socialized among a group of people and shared by them who can actually take responsibility for the co-op because they have the information, they know what decision-making is and what power is, and they like each other. So Chris? 
Yeah, thanks. Thanks, John. Um, and I've, I've really enjoyed hearing from everybody so far. And um, I think I think you all are probably pretty far along um, in your process. So um, uh, this is just to kind of map out typically what what folks all the steps that Carolyn covered earlier, um, often there are deliverables that come out of those steps. And so these are sort of the the examples of a, a almost physical um, deliverable out of those steps that Carolyn mentioned. So mission and goals are often a place where you start, which is, you know, that that problem um, that Johan was talking about and how you're going to solve that problem. And so you put it in a mission statement typically and come up with some goals. Um, and then you start working through the the thoughts of, you know, how is this business going to work um, and how is it going to be feasible uh, to make it work and um, think about the steps of how to get there. You all mentioned some member training um, and, you know, perhaps hiring some consultants for, for advice, that sort of thing. Um, often, a you know, a very formal uh, step is incorporating um, uh, I think I heard there was perhaps a, a choice of the employees buying the business. Um, so there's a decision of, do we create a new corporation or do we keep the same corporation and um, just um, change the bylaws underneath? Um, so those are some decisions to make. And then business and marketing plans. Um, and, and often where I pause here with business and marketing plans is I wouldn't get too stuck on sort of thinking about a really formal business plan or marketing plan. Um, you know, we as a lender aren't looking for a 50 page business uh, report. Um, Johan's gonna show later uh, a business model canvas where it's very much just filling in a table. Um, so we're, we're pretty flexible on, on, what, on what we call a business plan. It can be a slide deck. Um, we've taken grant applications as your business plan. What we don't want you to do is sort of create something just for us. Um, we want to take whatever is useful for you um, and, and we'll we'll consider that a business plan. Um, and then that'll get you to sort of start up financing and launching. Uh, and uh, it and gets you to the point where you can um, get started um, with with you know with the financing and where we and where we probably would step in and John, if you want to go to the next slide, uh, this kind of maps out where the source of funds can can come from to pay for these steps. Um, often in the in the feasibility stage, uh, there you know that that would be pretty tough, and you really wouldn't want to borrow a lot of money uh, before you start generating revenue. So, um, seeking out some grants, obviously, a lot of your time. Uh, a lot of uh, members' time is uh, sort of volunteer or in-kind uh, donations. Um, and then as you move along the process, you might want to think about some crowdfunding, fundraising, or friend raising. Um, and, uh, and then as the business itself and the business plan stage, when it's really becoming real, you've already incorporated, you might actually even start... Um, to do some pre-sales or have um, some member loans. Um, generally, member loans would be very flexible uh, or community loan member loans generally be really flexible with low interest rates and uh, a more flexible payment period. Um, and then that at that point, um, when you're ready to launch, you may want to take take a look at more formal capital, and that's that's where we're. Where we would probably step in is is right before you're about to launch. Um, uh, it, most of our uh, most of our financing is in a form of a loan. Um, as a co-op, you can raise what's called equity um, uh, beyond your own membership. Um, there's there's a bit of complication with that uh, because it's one member, one vote, and one share. So if you're selling additional equity um, to outside folks, um, there's a different level of scrutiny and, and just uh, those, often they're called class B investors, um, aren't allowed to vote. It's, the, it's that core group of members. Um, 
but they can't get a return. Usually they're aligned and, and, and sort of community members who care about what you're doing. Um, and often will will seek a, you know, a below market return. So it's, it's generally friendly capital as well. Um, you don't necessarily want a, a, you know, a real cutthroat venture capitalist, um, taking an investment in, in your co-op. Um, so I think we can probably go to the next slide. So along, along this way too, th there's, there's a lot of steps. And if, if you remember Carolyn's slide where there were a lot of squiggly lines going back and forth, there are certain points along this where, where you might decide, you know what, this doesn't look like it's going to make it. Um, it could be the dynamic of the group. It could be the business itself. Um, and it might be there just aren't enough customers out there. Um, and so there are a lot of decision points along the way that you have to make a decision of go, no go. Um, and we often say a no go decision isn't, isn't a bad thing because um, what's, what's, what can be detrimental is doing, you know, having a go decision and then six months later, um, it all falls apart. You borrow too much money um, or you all aren't getting along. Um, and so it's okay to either say, you know what, we, we probably just should just let this rest for a while and come back to it in a, in a year or so, um, or change your plans. So maybe it's not building a whole brand new manufacturing facility from scratch, for example, but maybe we're going to rent some equipment in a smaller building to get started. Um, and then two years down the line. Uh, so it's it's not always saying no. It's just either sometimes it's just pausing or changing your plans a little bit just to make sure it's feasible. And then this is just, a, I won't go through all this, but this is a basic list. Um, and I think, Joe, you, you all will get these slides. So you'll see um, if you all were to approach us, but quite honestly, if you were to approach a bank or a credit union, this is the basic same um, list of documents that we would want. Um, again, on the operation side, we're quite flexible on what you call a business plan. Um, it doesn't have to be a polished uh, you know, business school type business plan. Um, and then on the financials, uh, if, you're, if you're a startup, um, you're not going to have historical. You're just going to have um, projections, um, budgets, basically, um, that's in the lower right corner. So we won't have a lot of financials, and that's okay. We do work with with startups <laughs> as well. And so what we do is we focus much more on your governance. How are you all working as a team, um, and what are your plans? Um, and obviously, we we can't rely too much on your historical financials. Uh, but again, that's okay. We we like working with startups. So this is a rough list of what you expect to see a request from us, uh, but but also other financial institutions. And I think that's it, Johan. And so maybe briefly we'll touch on this piece. Um, for startups, we're developing a product called the Launch Lawn, and it tries to take into consideration that lack of collateral or stuff that you know, could be sold off to repay your lawn. It looks at different communities who might not have access to friends and family, some of the main sources of funding for startups. And so this is kind of a, a service, a financing service for early stage co-ops without access to those things that we're developing that who can follow up with. So it has two stages, one to support those early stage soft costs, those pre-development costs, and then a second stage when you're ready to access larger um, amounts of capital for larger purchases. And so, you know, this is just a quick overview. And uh, we're tight on time. So I'm going to attach a few resources to the final slide. When we send this out, you can access the business model canvas, the ownership model canvas. Those are the two engines of any cooperative enterprise the cooperation sustained through membership and governance, and the enterprise sustained through value proposition, uh, offering a solid value proposition to business model. And so if you're ready to launch, you know, we've talked about solving the problem. Is it the right problem defined by that community? Is your community organized? You might start off with a steering committee, evolve into project teams, 
but ultimately has to reorganize itself into membership, a meaningful membership experience that empowers the people with information, with the right knowledge and the right rewards. And yes, what power is, the ability to create change in your community. So that's what we encourage as you consider, are we ready to launch? And these are the resources I mentioned. I would advise you to go to our website, click learning. You see a lots of different resources there. We also have a YouTube playlist of different webinars from the past. You can tune into those. And we have a monthly newsletter, the co-op monthly, that you can access and see different webinars each month from us and for our partners or friends, other folks in the co-op ecosystem. The tools I mentioned, design your co-op, business model canvas, ownership model canvas. Once you get this, you can click on any of these and it should connect you to a copy that you can use for yourself. And if you are interested in taking the next steps, I know some of you have done this before, you can schedule an intro call. That's a time slot to discuss some of your concerns with one of the members of the learning team. And if you have any other questions, email us. So I know we're about six minutes over. I want to thank you for your time. And if you have any other questions, we can stick around for a bit. Otherwise, I want to let you beautiful people get back to your evening to get some dinner and all that good stuff. All right. So thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you all. This is great. Thanks very much. So thank you, Steve. Hesitate. Uh, <laughs> uh, Johan, um, uh, first of all, thank you so much for all this information. Um, and yeah, um, but uh, we had a, a quick question. So we're starting, like there is an entity, right? And we're starting a new entity. Um, so I think we're wondering what would we be classified as, as a startup or like, is this something where like mm -hmm. we, you know, the financials would make sense, right? Yeah, so so, so. Maggie yeah. did mention that it could be useful for us to include financial reporting on small format so far, um, but also, yeah, since we're gonna be a new um, set of ownership and technically a new entity, we were just, we feel like we're in a weird gray area and we wanna make sure we're including, you know. Yeah, just to add to that, like, and we're also creating like, whole new tiers of revenue um through like um gathering getting new licensing for like catering and um, also doing like a merchandising um program so those are those don't exist current like they we wouldn't have projections for any of that um yeah so are we i'm like would it be considered a start up or even though there's like bones of a mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so i mean quick off the bat uh once you exist as a business and you decide we're going to convert to a co-op your startup co-op right you're an existing business but now you're entering into what it means to be shared ownership typically you might go out and value your business and sell it to your employees if you're worried about succession. Or maybe you're now thinking, we're going to create this co-op and we're going to do this together. You know, Instead of just being owner workers, we're going to own it together. So I'm not selling it to you guys and walking away. We're going to kind of do this thing together. So you, know, you might decide how you want to take that step, but you're becoming an emerging cooperative. Cooper, um, cooperative, sorry. And so it's okay to consider yourself as an emerging co-op, a startup co-op, even if you're an existing business, because you're converting, you know? So you're bringing a lot of bones, a lot of acumen, a lot of resources, but it, as far as being a co-op, a shared entity, it's okay to consider yourself as a startup. What do you think, Chris? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And, and just from a financing perspective, um, we definitely would. The if you're you all in Rhode Island, so you probably would interact with my colleague Maggie, um, who covers Rhode Island, um, and um, she probably would want to look at your historical financials. Just to, it gives us a sense, even if you might sort of go in other directions, it just gives that base to us that perhaps 
you know, our typical startup loan isn't much more than $50,000. If you're a pure startup, like nothing existed before three people coming together, want to start tomorrow. Generally it's not over 50, but if, if there's sort of a base of financial and operational uh, things, we can, we can generally go above that. Um, it also, you know, it really depends on to you, the owner is at what price am I going to sell um, the business to the employees? And usually it's based on that historical financial performance, your clientele, um, that sort of thing in terms of the valuation, you know, a fair, a fair valuation um, that that's going to help you as the business owner too. Um, you, even if and we've seen it, it's amazing how even a lot of times uh, uh, one of our colleagues at the Cooperative Development Institute often um, as they work on conversions, there's, there's two parts to the change. There's a change in management and there's a change in ownership and they don't always have to happen at the same time. Um, often he recommends that management can change even before ownership, the formal handover, like the legal handover, you can start making those changes on management much earlier. Um, like, you know, the, the types of governance that you all were talking about, um, uh, you could start that now. And, you know, I've seen it a lot with conversions where they start making investment choices that the previous owner never would have done on his own, on his or her own. And it's pretty cool to see sort of even, even before the conversion happens, just, you know, they're full, you know, full of great ideas and, and where the, you know, how the business could grow and get better. And yeah. So, um, I was going to say one other thing, but I think I forgot it. Yeah, sorry. And Atlas, I think you were going to say something. Sorry. Oh no, no, I'm I'm good. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, the the one thing, yeah, I mean, I mean, for you all, I think it's about half and half from what I've heard and seen in terms of conversions. Sometimes the the old business just dissolves and goes away, and a whole new business is created, and everything is just transferred over. Um, and sometimes you just, you keep the entity itself and just underneath the new ownership structure and bylaws and everything appear and replace the old structure. And sometimes it's, it, it depends on kind of like, well, sometimes it's just brand recognition, you know, um, and, but also, also sometimes it's your business relationships, like with your vendors, your bank, all those things. If you create a whole new corporation you have to start over with all those relationships so there's some decisions around there um, that you have to make yeah yeah no that's um, all really really helpful insight um we are lucky that Tamika early on thought to you know create an LLC for themselves and then do business as small format so the idea is that we will also do business as small format because that name is not, um, anyways, that's getting into the weeds. Um, and I don't mean to take up time with that right now, but yeah, um, very, very helpful. And so I wanted to stay on the call a little longer cause I was like, I'm sure we'll have more questions, but I think at this point, yeah, all of that was very thorough. Excellent. And I just dropped a link in the chat, become an employee owned. Yes, can prove that if you haven't seen that. All right. Everyone good? Steve, you good? Great. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah, good luck great. with uh with your business in Rhode Island. Yeah, good luck. Yeah. Yeah, sounds exciting. Yes. Very exciting. Yeah. That's so exciting. So good night, everybody. Reach out. You'll get the slides. Take advantage of that link or send an email. And um, you know, keep on keep on um, cooperating and <laughs> finding ways to solve these problems together. Take care. Good night. Good night. Good night. Let's start recording.